Good evening, everyone. So today, I'm going to teach all of you how to clap with one hand. OK, no, I'm not. <laughs> but I do want to start with a small exercise, cool? OK, so first, can everyone clap with both hands? Just give me a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> OK, now can everyone clap with one hand? OK, I see people are getting creative. Nice, nice. So, <laughs> so I'm sure at this point you all are probably wondering, uh, besides what we're doing, um, what is the purpose of trying to clap with one hand if you have two? Well, you would not be the first to ask this question. This talk is inspired by MKO Abiola, Nigerian activist and leader who said no man can clap with one hand. Borrowing from MKO Abiola, Ghanaian playwright and women's rights activist gave a talk this past November where she said, trying to develop a nation without including women as part of that process is like telling a person to clap with one hand. Unfortunately, we know there's a whole lot of one hand clapping going on today. Fortunately though, we know that through education, we can change this. For educating women and girls has been linked to a number of positive outcomes. Educated women are 50% more likely to immunize their children, and their children are two times more likely to survive to the age of five. Girls who receive basic education are three times less likely to contract HIV and AIDS. This is just basic education. Even more interesting, educated mothers invest 90% of their incomes back into their families. I guess it's true when they say when you educate a woman, you educate a nation. The reality, however, is that 53% of those who remain uneducated in this world are girls. To be sure, in the US, you know, women have now surpassed men at most levels of education. But in most countries, the opposite is still true. In countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, girls have less than a 50% chance of finishing primary school compared to their male counterparts. I should say at this point though, this is not a talk meant to frame the experiences of African women and girls as somehow unique. It's actually to show the important lessons and benefits that we can learn when we focus in on their experiences. Before I delve in, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised right here in Chicago, Illinois, but of Ghanaian immigrants. But before college, I spent very little time in the homelands of my parents. So in 2009, as an idealistic undergrad interested in getting back to my roots, I decided to study abroad in Ghana at the University of Ghana. Well, before I left, I decided to apply for a grant in order to get kind of some extra funds to survive while I was out there. Well, part of the requirement was conducting an independent study. Really, I didn't want to do a long paper assignment, so I chose instead to film the female students that I took classes with. Um, really, it was a shortcut, but what started off as a shortcut ended up taking me on my longest journey yet. My mom often laughs when I say my longest journey yet, <laughs> um, but I'm 23 years old and I've been working on the project for four years, so <laughs> it feels like a long time. Um, and the reality was that I got totally carried away by the project. This is because what it meant to be a female student in Ghana had almost never been more important. While just a few decades earlier, girls represented the single digits in terms of numbers of enrollment at the secondary and university levels of education, two decades later, women were now double, triple, quadruple that number. And Ghana was just one small part of this larger effort to educate girls around the world. You see, many countries had recognized that in order to develop a nation, you needed to include women as part of that process, but you had to educate them first. Thus, here you had a nation who once made the primary office of the woman the kitchen, now allowing girls to access levels of education their parents could have never imagined. I wanted to know who were these girls that were getting access and what was enabling them to do well in this environment. I returned to Ghana in 2010 to answer this question and also to take that which I had filmed and turn it into a documentary. Oh, but I didn't mention, I actually have no formal training in research or film um, so this was actually rather ambitious. Um, so instead of me being the big researcher and director, I was more of the one being researched and directed, but this turned out to be even better as I got a deep level, like a deep sense of the experience of the girls I worked with 
And so from them, I learned many lessons. These lessons are what, are, is what I really want to share with you all today. So many of the girls I worked with weren't just disadvantaged in terms of their female status. They were economically disadvantaged as well. So I knew part of trying to understand how they were navigating through this new educational environment was to get a sense of how their disadvantage structured their experiences. Well, these girls would tell me things like, well, you have to be determined. You have to believe in yourself. You have to know who you are. Or they would say things like, I don't get discouraged. When I want something done, I get it done. I thought, wow, these girls had a deep level of confidence about who they are or what they could do or who they could be. I thought, where did these beliefs come from? And how are these beliefs enabling girls to be academically successful? What I found is that what these beliefs were doing was allowing girls to reframe their disadvantage. This meant not that girls didn't realize they were disadvantaged. In fact, they had a high perception of the barriers they would face, but they had an even higher belief in their ability to overcome them. And education played an important role in this, as education wasn't just solidifying or cementing these identities. For many girls, education was the very mechanism that was instilling this belief in self in the first place. This highlighted the ways in which education is not just a body right, for disseminating information, but also the role in education in taking disadvantaged students and enabling them to be academically successful by instilling with them a belief that they can achieve. And this was important not just for understanding how, you know, when we take girls and we have them reframe disadvantage, how this could help them, but even as a researcher, what happens when we reframe the questions that we ask about disadvantage? When instead of focusing on, you know, why girls aren't achieving, when we rather ask questions about why girls are achieving, how can we then focus in on their experiences so we can replicate that and enable girls to be academically successful and thus better prepared to help develop the nation? These are the lessons that I learned and I've been sharing it since as I'm sharing with you all today. But along the way, I've gotten a really important question. And that's, well, Sally, it's cool and all. This belief in self is allowing girls who aren't traditionally associated with success to be academically successful. But if at the fundamental level, these girls do not have the resources then really, how far can a belief in self take them? This was an important question, right? By 2011, many of the girls I worked with had graduated from high school, but many of them did not enroll straight into college. Many of the girls took time off so they could work to save money for application fees or even to take the exam to go to college. So it wasn't clear that even though they had this deep level of confidence or this belief that they can achieve, that they actually would fulfill their academic potential. I returned to Ghana in 2012, when many of the girls had at least figured out a way to apply for college. And I watched as one of the girls I worked with, Esther, got admitted into Ghana's top university, but did not enroll because her mother had not the slightest way of affording it. Imagine a girl who already was from a disadvantaged background, right? But somehow was able to graduate at the top of her class you know, was able to then get scores that got her into a top university, not be able to enroll because she did not have the resources. This made it clear to me that sure, while belief in self was important, of course she would not be able to do it alone, right? So this brings me to my last two points. And the first is really simple. And that is the reality that kids do not choose to be born poor. Girls like Esther, were brought into this world at a disadvantage, not just because of her female status, but because of her socioeconomic status. And this is of no fault of her own. But at the end of the day, she's still expected to run the same race. While we can argue with the expectation, this brings forth the requirement on the part of all of us to ensure that just because someone was born into a particular set of circumstances, that this is not necessarily tied to their outcome. So that despite where girls like Esther start, they can still finish strong. This brings me to my last point, and it's really simple, and that's the importance of lifting others up as you climb. Girls like Esther need to be literally lifted up, pulled, and dragged to the finish line where they need to be. Today, I am proud to say that Esther's enrolled in college. And this is because once her headmistress discovered that she was admitted and did not enter college, she took out an equivalent of three months of her salary to pay for Esther to go to college. She said she just couldn't see her brilliance go to waste. Esther's headmistress recognized that Esther needed the education, so she took it upon herself 
to make sure that Esther got it. Like Esther, I'm what they consider to be disadvantaged in the U.S. I'm first generation from a single parent, low income home, the list goes on. If it wasn't for people like the headmistress was for Esther, I certainly wouldn't have been able to realize this level of education. Sometimes I'm still really surprised that I've been able to do it. You see, but stories like mine or Esther's, you know, aren't stories of individual resilience, right? That's just half the story. Our stories are really reflective of a long line of lifting. It's about those who took the time to lift up others so that those others could then lift people like me up and I could talk to you all about lifting many more. And it's not just about lifting up girls, right? It's about lifting up disadvantaged people more generally. So yes, boys have to lift up girls, but women have to lift up men, have have to lift up have nots, and everyone in between, because while our starting points might be different, and often they are, our endpoints are not only connected, but dependent on each other. So we can't sit there and watch girls be excluded from education, right? But Neither can, should women be excluded from public office or poor from mainstream society. No, everyone that's been left out and excluded needs to be included and lifted up by each of us. Education is the mechanism to do that lifting. But it requires us to recognize that girls like Esther can't do it alone. Disadvantaged people can't do it alone. Really, none of us can do it alone, and none of us should have to. Why clap with one hand if you have two? Thank you.